Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm Dorothy Barnett, Executive Director of the Climate and Energy Project and your moderator for this evening. Tonight, we'll be wrapping up our summer long workshop series with support from the Kansas Department of Commerce. Uh, Zach Eddy with the Kansas Department of Parks, Wildlife and Tourism will share information about wind development and wildlife. And he will be joined by Pete Farrell to add his perspective as a landowner with wind turbines. I know that conversations about wind energy development can be an emotional topic and that tonight we may have those who ardently support wind as well as those who are maybe ardently opposed. We use a simple set of rules to guide our interactions in this virtual space and beyond, and we ask for your help with them tonight. The most effective use of our time together is to ask questions in the chat rather than to add commentary. So when Kansans have questions about renewable energy, they turn to the Climate and Energy Project. We call ourselves CEP. For 14 years, CEP has been a trusted leader focusing on renewable energy as a productive long-term solution with economic, environmental, and climate benefits. Our mission is to build resilience in Kansas through equitable clean energy solutions and climate action. Our programs address clean energy, climate resilience, climate and energy policy, and civic participation. Using a collaborative approach, CEP connects people, organizations, and ideas. We present science-based facts, facilitate critical thinking and community engagement, and we co-create equitable and productive solutions. Our work drives climate adaptation and reduces risk while increasing community resilience in Kansas. Our work throughout the state has connected us to the business community, chambers of commerce, economic development, education, faith, environmental and agriculture organizations, among many others. We have been a resource for planning commissions, county commissions, and policymakers at the local and state level who are navigating the transition to clean energy. This is the fifth and final session of our similar wind energy series. You can find previous workshop videos and presentation materials on our website. So I'd like to begin tonight's presentation by sharing a little bit about Kansas and our place in the wind industry. At the end of 2020, Kansas ranked number two in wind as a percentage of our total generation. We were number three in corporate wind purchases, number four in wind power installed capacity, and number four in wind power generation. We were also number five in the number of wind turbine installations with a total investment in our state of $11.4 billion. Wind energy in Kansas powers the equivalent of 1.97 million homes. In 2019, Kansas generated 41.45% of its electricity from wind power. There are numerous environmental benefits from generating wind power. It creates no emissions and it uses virtually no water. As you can see, wind farms and businesses serving the wind industry are all across the state. At the end of 2020, we had 7,306.25 megawatts of wind energy. When fully developed, operating wind farms and those under construction will represent 8,000 megawatts of wind energy, varying in size from a four megawatt project at Fort Hayes State University to the 470 megawatt Flat Ridge II project spanning four counties. If you'll go back to the previous slide, this is a slide created by the Kansas Department of Commerce. It's interesting to see how many Kansas counties are currently hosting wind farms. Over the life of these wind projects, those counties will receive over $657 million in donation agreements and property tax payments. They will have benefited from over 8,000 construction jobs, over 563 permanent jobs, and nearly 13,000 indirect and induced jobs. Now that you've seen just a little bit about Kansas and the wind industry, I'd like to begin by introducing you to our first speaker. Zach Edney was raised in Dodge City 
and has a family background in farming and ranching. He holds a bachelor's degree in biology from Bethel College and a master's degree in geography from Kansas State University, Go Cats. Schooling and previous employment experiences have given him the opportunity to work with landowners, public agencies, and nonprofits on a wide variety of research and conservation projects. Following grad school, Zach started his career working with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's habitat and population evaluation team, doing habitat and species distribution modeling focused on non-game federal trust species. For just under five years, he has been employed as a terrestrial ecologist for wildlife and parks, where his primary responsibilities include non-game species and habitat conservation, as well as energy development, siting consultations, and permitting. Zach understands the economic and conservation priorities at work in the Kansas landscape and hopes to act as a bridge between the people when possible. He and his family and their ever-expanding array of pets make their homes on a few acres outside of Iuka, Kansas. And now it's my pleasure for you to get started, Zach. Thank you. Hi, thank you for that introduction. Um, I am uh, going to stop my video here once I get into the talk, just in case there's some bandwidth issues, but I'll be sure to turn it back on if there's any questions uh, at the end. But uh, if, um, yep, there's the slideshow. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please, Aaron. Okay. Um, I work out of the uh, Pratt, Kansas headquarters for the department. Uh, we're a fairly small section within the overall department uh, called the Ecological Services section. It's made up of, of my boss, biologists, which are our field research crews and uh, crew leaders and technicians who go out and do uh, non-game species research projects across the state. Uh, all year and and they're maybe best known by any local landowners uh, for the stream crews that go out and, and do uh, stream fish surveys uh, each summer they've they've made uh, uh, wide treks across the state and have been doing that for I believe 27 years now uh, all summer each summer so so they've they've been on a number of properties. Um, and then the other branch of, of our section are the ecologists like myself. And, and we do uh, research grant management and, and coordination, as well as uh, development project reviews, both for energy and, and any other uh, development projects that require an, an uh, environmental review from the department. Um, next slide. So I won't uh, belabor this point, but, but uh, some people are surprised to learn that Kansas has our own Endangered Species Act, similar to the Federal Endangered Species Act. And that's made up of 12 statutes uh, enacted um, from 1975 on, and, and that protects a state-specific list of, of uh, wildlife species native to Kansas. And, and uh, by and large grants this agency the responsibility and authority to conserve and recover the populations of any species listed uh, here within the state's borders. Next slide. And when I talk about endangered species uh, within Kansas, um, being a privately, you know, largely privately owned state, we often get asked, uh, how the residents of the state feel about that. In our most recent survey, which was 10 years ago, 91% of, of randomly polled residents uh, uh, supported some form of species and habitat conservation and, and protection. Uh, and that was, that was as unbiased a sample as we could get. It was done by a third party polling firm called uh, Responsive Management, an out of state firm. And, and we tried to get a broad uh, cross section of, of the demographics in the state. That uh, survey is actually being updated in 2021. Um, so we will have some new numbers hopefully next year when the report comes out to, to uh, uh, share with folks. If you'd like to read any more about uh, the, those responses or dig into some of the nuances of those things, uh, you can certainly do that by viewing the Kansas Wildlife Action Plan that's available at, on our website. Um, 
but one of the interesting nuances was that that we even had majority support of, of Kansas residents, 58%, if, if my memory serves, that supported the conservation of species that are imperiled here within the state, but are doing, doing well in other states. So there is there's a broad uh, community so that is supportive of wildlife species conservation and habitat conservation here within the state, which, which makes it a lot easier uh, for us to do our jobs. Next slide, please. So just to uh, uh, give you kind of a quick rundown of, of those species listing, the, the, the species listings largely mirror the Federal Endangered Species Act. Uh, the most imperiled would those be listed as endangered. Uh, that basically just means that, that those are likely to become extirpated from the state uh, in the near future without strong conservation measures. Uh, those that are threatened would be a step below that and, and could without continued conservation and habitat protections become endangered species in the foreseeable future. And then there is a third lower tier, which is essentially a watch list um, of those that, that may need to be further listed and receive some habitat protections in the future without, without uh, uh, rebounds in their populations or habitat availability. Um, next slide. So um, to, to uh, regulate those, those potential habitat and species impacts, our section provides uh, environmental reviews for, for uh, uh, projects which may affect either the, the species themselves or their designated critical habitat. And any project that receives uh, federal, state, or county funds is, is obligated to get an environmental review. Also, things that, that don't receive funding but may receive techn technical assistance from the state or federal government would require a review. And finally, any activity that requires any other state or federal permitting uh, uh, from a, a federal or state agency. So that could be the Kansas Department of Ag, such as the Division of Water Resources, if there's you know, a floodplain permit that's needed, um, Waters of the US uh, 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 reviews also have to get a state species environmental review uh, and so forth. And, and where we find a broad nexus to engage with, with wind farms generally become, uh, comes through the permitting with the Kansas Department of Health and Environment uh, and their construction stormwater permitting to make sure there's not, you know, uh, a erosion or runoff that may lower water quality in the state's waters. Um, it is important to remember that Kansas Department of Wildlife, Parks and Tourism does not have any authority to deny any project. I get a number of calls from, from folks and, and not even relative to wind, just any development that, that want me, that you know they cite a, cite a wildlife concern and say, well, because there's a bald eagle here, can you tell them they can't build their hotel? And, and no, I, I cannot do that. What we can do is require certain certain things be done to offset the loss of habitat or to minimize any impacts to a listed species, we cannot say, uh, no, this project cannot go forward. Next slide, please. So relative to wind energy projects, the department has uh, created and then in 2017 updated what we call our wind energy position statement. And that gives broad guidance, both for the public and developers to, uh, uh, for site selection recommendations and pre and post construction survey recommendations to help guide the, the siting process for new developments. Uh, that's available on our website. And I believe CEP has also posted it on theirs. And, and it's pretty easy to find if you just Google the agency's name and, and wind position. Relative to these projects and any other large scale energy projects, be that a, a, an interstate pipeline or, or a solar farm, we appreciate what we would consider an iterative process of consultation where we, where we can have multiple contacts between the department and those project developers to try to get a broad sense of, of the overall landscape and then 
really refine siting decisions and recommendations kind of at the micro scale to try to avoid and minimize impacts as much as possible. So generally we'll have several in-person or, or web-based meetings where we'll uh, discuss the initial site at the broad scale, then review field siting studies that are, that are done by the developers uh, that may inform bird or, or other wildlife use of an area. Um, we request all the development details, uh, turbine siting locations, access roads, and, and all the other infrastructure that goes along with the development, at which point we will conduct our environmental review. Uh, the review is guided by our existing statutes and regulations, so uh, we can only make requirements of, of a company if there's going to be an impact to designated critical habitat or state listed wildlife species. Otherwise, we provide uh, recommendations and advice uh, in those letters, and we always uh, CC or, or send a copy of our review letters um, to the local county where a development is going to occur. And this is, this is just for transparency. I've had a number of counties that, that have requested to get this, um, and, and it just became easier uh, uh, since I can't go to every zoning board meeting to just go ahead and send that to the county and let them, let them include it in their file of public comments. Next slide. Okay, so I will try to step through this pretty quickly, but I wanted to provide some sense of, of the process by which we go through when we review uh, when we review these projects. And, and what you'll see is early on, it really does hinge on whether we have designated critical habitat. That's what DCH stands for on this slide. Uh, next slide. So to define critical habitat, we're essentially looking at areas that uh, are currently supporting a self-sustaining population of a state-listed species. They have the physical and biological features there uh, within that local landscape that are essential uh, uh, to maintaining that species. Um, and it can also include areas that don't have existing populations, but do have the features necessary to allow in, uh, uh, rebounding populations of that imperiled species to move back into. So, so we can't recover a species unless we have habitat for them to move into. So there are some portions of, of critical habitat that don't have a listed species. They're, we're, they're being protected in hopes that, that uh, our other conservation efforts uh, will increase the population such that they have, can move into and repopulate those areas. Next slide. So this is just a map. It's actually uh, slightly outdated now, uh, but it gives you a sense of where we have critical habitat in the state. The blue lines are, are waters, uh, streams and rivers that have aquatic listed species within them. The green are all terrestrial based species. And, and it's important to note that in those green boxes, such as, as Clark County down in Southwest Kansas, Clark County as a whole would not be considered designated critical habitat, but for the couple of species that do a, that are state listed and occur within Clark County, uh, this is a signal that if, a, if uh, we encounter habitat appropriate for those species in that area, it would be considered appropriate. So uh, at the broad scale, cropland, uh, urban areas, previously developed sites, those are generally not going to fall into designated critical habitat uh, by and large. Um, what we really are, are concerned with are, are streams, wetlands, native prairie, and uh, native woodlands as we get into the eastern part of the state. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So uh, considering uh, uh, designated critical habitat, when we're engaging on a wind project, once we get all the pertinent information from the developer, we'll begin our desktop review. And we, we put all that in a, a, a computer mapping program uh, where we can look at species occurrences, whether there's designated critical habitat in that project area. And, and we'll move forward uh, making some, some general determinations of whether we need to, 
to potentially issue an action permit for, for impacts to state listed species or not. Assuming there's not a critical habitat impact, we will just move to uh, what we call standard BMPs. And if you'd go to the next slide, Darren, that's basically, uh, we send a letter where we say a permit will not be required from, from this department and we'll offer broad recommendations and suggest best management practices to help minimize and further avoid impacts to, to any other wildlife that might be in that species. So that might be recommendations of what habitat types to avoid, uh, how to re, uh, best restore a site back to pre-construction conditions, um, uh, bridge and culvert design recommendations are very, very calm because uh, uh, common because those can become barriers to passage um, and so forth. Um, one thing I would point out is that even if we go into this space and there's not a critical habitat impact, that doesn't mean the department doesn't necessarily have some specific wildlife concerns. It just means that we have no statutory authority to require anything of the company. And we try to be very clear about that. If, if we're concerned about native prairie impacts, uh, we'll note that we have that concern offer recommendations on, on alternative siting locations or, or ways to minimize uh, the, the permanent and temporary removal of, of that important habitat or, or how to, to uh, uh, potentially minimize you know, direct, uh, direct mortality impacts uh, with turbines and, and so forth. Um, but, but we cannot make a, a specific requirement of, of a project developer to, to follow that guidance. Conversely, if you'd go to the next slide, Aaron, uh, if a project is within critical habitat, we've got kind of a longer process that we follow. We'll go uh, do site evaluations to determine the, the quality uh, of that habitat. Um, and whether, whether you know, moving forward with the project will require a special action permit be issued by this department to authorize those impacts. And, and what that generally is going to do is put potentially some timing restrictions on, on when activities can happen, uh, site restoration uh, requirements, uh, as opposed to just recommendations, uh, and all the way up to uh, compensatory mitigation, which would be uh, if, if designated critical habitat will be permanently removed by a project, we can require that that, that be offset through habitat restoration or creation offsite. Um, and that's, that's actually quite rare uh, with all the projects we review um, to, to have to go all the way to compensatory mitigation. Generally through the consultation process, we can avoid and minimize those habitat impacts to such a scale that, that there's no need to, to uh, go all the way down to habitat replacement. Uh, once a pro uh, an action permit is issued, then project construction can start. Once that construction is completed, we will uh, check the permit conditions, make sure they have been complied with and close, close that permit down. So if you'd uh, move to my last slide, Aaron, just to, um, oh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I forgot to tell you <laughs> uh, to move to this slide. Um, so uh, like I said, the, uh, 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 when we go do a site visit, we'll determine the impact, whether it's permanent or temporary. Uh, and require some special conditions within that permit. And the last slide, please. And just to give you a sense, uh, we review about 2000 projects a year. Um, uh, about 10% of those may go, uh, excuse me, about 1% of those may go to an actual action permit. And those that require actual habitat compensation at the end of that process are, are about one tenth of 1% annually. So, so we only see one or two of those projects a year. Um, developers by and large are good at avoiding those most critical areas. Um, and that's all I have. I'm happy to entertain any questions now or, or at the end of, of the uh, uh, forum here.
Um, so hello, Zach. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. Um, I noted in the in the chat that my internet is a little bit unstable, so I apologize. Can you hear me okay? I Perfect. Can. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> good, good. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so I'm going to ask again if anybody has any questions for Zach, and and if not, I may I may ask a few. Um, so. CEP team, any questions in the chat yet or on Facebook? Okay, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask some kind of general questions, Zach. Um, what types of species in Kansas are um, either threatened or endangered um, that, that might be a, of concern in particularly a wind project area. I know that there are maybe a long list. So you don't certainly have to give all of them to us, but um, can you can you share a little bit about kind of what types of, of, of both species and then maybe habitat um, a little with a little more detail? Uh, uh, certainly. Um, you know, from a, uh, uh, a wind perspective, our first concern is is direct collision risk and, and birds and bats uh, uh, bear the weight of, of that risk, uh, especially those that are migratory species. Um, so, so we do try to uh, encourage sighting outside of, of, you know, migratory corridors uh, where they exist in the state or, or habitat features that may draw migratory animals in as, as stopover habitat. The best example of that on our state list is, is the whooping crane, which is also federally listed. Um, uh, I'm sure a lot of people on, on this, uh, on this uh, stream will be familiar with, with the whooping crane, but it's, it's a very imperiled population. They, are, they have high site fidelity, so they, they maintain a fairly consistent migratory corridor generally stopping over at, at either Quivera National Wildlife Refuge or Cheyenne Bottoms in uh, Stafford and, and Barton County primarily. Um, and, and they're very consistent uh, going through the, the very central part of Kansas uh, each year. Um, uh, you know, th th there has, to my knowledge, uh, certainly not in Kansas, there's never been a proven uh, collision with with whooping cranes and turbines, but given how low their population is, I, right now that's around 500 individuals in that migratory population. Um, uh, you know, the and and they're very they have very low uh, fecundity. They don't have many babies, um, so the loss of a breeding adult can can be quite detrimental. So that's that would be the first risk. The second risk is, is just to the native, uh, native type habitats um, and, and those species that would be obligated to that native habitat. Kansas is actually very lucky in, uh, as compared to a lot of our surrounding states and, and agricultural states that we maintain a fairly high proportion of, of our native grasslands. Uh, we have some, some remnant native woodlands in eastern Kansas uh, and, and especially those grasslands in a much higher proportion than, than say Nebraska or, or uh, uh, Oklahoma to the south, especially our tall grass and mixed grass prairie areas in, in eastern and, and central Kansas. So, so impacts to those are, are of concern and, and that would be from any development, not, uh, you know, you can take what I'm saying relative to wind tonight to, to really include most of the development projects I, re, I review, whether that's a transmission line, an oil pipeline, what have you, um, we, we really try to encourage no further fragmentation or loss of, of that native habitat, which is likely to infect, uh, affect those species that are obligated to those areas. Thanks for that, Zach. One, one kind of follow-up question on that that I have often wondered, um, you know, is, is, is it considered native grass if it's, you know, land that's been in CRP for a long time or, or land that 
just nobody's doing anything with it. It's just, it's just farmer or ranchers allowed it to just grow wild. Um, how do you make that distinction? Um, so there, there is certainly some nuance there. And, and what, I would, what I would say is, is that current actively enrolled CRP, we do not consider, uh, if, if there's a grassland habitat that's des designated for a species in, in a local area, uh, and, and we become aware that, that a certain area is enrolled in the CRP program, we will kick that out of, of any, you know, mitigation requirements. We, we would encourage avoidance, uh, encourage any temporary impacts be restored, and so forth. But, but uh, those, those conservation reserve program lands continue to, to get crop, cropping history uh, a number of them revert back to cropland at the end of a contract period, and, and it's a fairly ephemeral thing. We, did not we do not want to try to uh, or be seen as penalizing folks for doing the right thing for conservation during the length of that contract and, and make them scared that once they plant it to grass, they can't, they can't take it back out of grass. Now, uh, on the flip side of that coin, you would be shocked about the amount of land in Kansas that, that over 150 years has been, has been tilled up. And, and a number of those lands, uh, this, this landscape behind, uh, behind my, my contact information in the Red Hills, while a little bit degraded from, from trees, I suspect those mesas that you see uh, in the top left uh, may have been cropped at one point at, in the turn of the century. Uh, there is a lot of very well functioning, diverse, uh, quality grassland that 100 years of moat go may have been cropped. And we would consider that native prairie. And that is based on the species composition, the, the structure of that prairie. It's, it's uh, providing all the habitat needs uh, of those species that would reside there. So, so you, you know, there's, there's, there's not a hard fast rule what you know if if something was crp uh but two years ago the contract expired and it has not been broken out um you know that is probably something that that we would regulate because it's not actively enrolled in that in that conservation reserve program and at least for those that period of two years the landowners have not decided to revert it back to crop land so um we're, we're generally unconcerned with management, whether it's grazed or ungrazed. Um, these prairies all, all, you know, evolved with grazing, so we do not see that as a detriment. Even some amount of overgrazing or haying, uh, we would consider fairly ephemeral in ecological time. So, so uh, as long as those native grassland, warm season grasses that we would expect to find in, in native prairie are still there, um, the management of, of an area could change and, and, and certainly it provide the, the structure and quality that the wildlife is looking for. So, so there's a lot of gray in there. Um, that's kind of the, the area we have to work in as far as, as uh, determining wildlife impacts and, and so forth. The, the letter of the law is, is very black and white, but, but the the landscape doesn't necessarily function like that. Thank you so much, Zach. Um, clear as mud for, for those of us who are not um, in this every day, but we appreciate your, you trying to simplify it for all of us. Um, if you'll stick around, we're gonna hear from um, Pete Farrell now, and we may have some additional questions that um, come from the end, but, but help me give a virtual hand to uh, Zach Eddy for his presentation. So it's my pleasure now to introduce um, my friend, Pete Farrell. Um, Pete has worked at the Farrell Ranch, which was established by his great grandfather in 1888, basically all of his adult life. Uh, he was the initiator of and the primary land holding member in the development of the Elk River Wind Farm constructed on the Farrell Ranch in 2005. He also worked as a project development consultant for Energy for Generations, a wind power development company, 
Pete was one of the first people that I met when I started back in this job uh, nearly 15 years ago. And uh, Elk River remains one of my favorite places to visit. So Pete, we're, we're happy to have you here tonight to talk about your experience with wildlife um, on, your, on your wind farm. Welcome. Thank you, Dorothy. I appreciate your inviting me to speak here. And I really appreciate uh, Zach's presentation. It uh, adds a lot of clarity to issues that I actually was not fully familiar with, but I appreciate that very much. If you'll go to the first slide, Aaron. Um, I'm starting here with uh, what I call our back to the future slide. Um, <clears throat> we go backwards to look at the, the immense power of ruminants to, to form and fashion this, this ecosystem. And um, decades ago, I was influenced by one of, well, my father to begin with, and then, uh, but, but we, we look to nature as measure here when we look at our ranching practices. Uh, in the background, you can see the, the wind farm on this property that was installed in 2005. Um, I was approached, uh, I'll quickly go through the kind of the history of that. I was approached in 1994 uh, by a developer. <clears throat> Their wind farming, nobody was talking about wind farming in Kansas in 1994, but uh, the, there was a retired professor from K-State who, who was a professor of electrical engineering who had re retired early. And uh, he and another dear friend of mine, Joe King, had already started mapping uh, the wind in Kansas. And they, they knew a great deal more about my ranch than I did. And um, <clears throat> uh, this gentleman, Dr. Johnson, came to me uh, with, a, with, a, with a company representative and said, we, we want you to consider this. And quite frankly, at, uh, to begin with, I, uh, again, nobody <clears throat> in 1994, uh, it, was, it, was, uh, <laughs> it was pretty much unknown thing. Uh, I'll fast forward through it, though, but by saying that the thing that uh, kind of gave me the greatest comfort was to go to California, talk with other ranchers, and understand that the presence of wind turbines did not interfere with their agricultural operations, and that it, that it could be done in, in ways that were ecologically sound. And I, I, that's, that was the tipping point for me to finally agree. Um, it took 10 years. The first developer walked away. I located a second one. And uh, the rest is history. If you'll go to the next slide, please, Aaron. We have um, a tremendous um, ecosystem here. It's, uh, quite frankly, I live in heaven. Uh, I live in a hunter's paradise. I live in a fisherman's paradise. Um, this ecosystem is, is valuable to us. We, uh, we, we um, again, we, we have hunters here that uh, we, we derive a significant amount of income from, from promoting a healthy ecosystem that includes a significant amount of wildlife uh, here. Can you go to the next slide, please? Again, fishing is uh, not uncommon. These are spring fred lakes that you're seeing. Uh, next slide, please. Um, that's actually the, the same pond at a different time of year. Uh, we track and measure our wildlife. Next slide, please. Um, and again, the, it's the abundance of the tall grasses here that provide our basic living. That's still the, the core income of this ranch is through uh, producing edible red meat uh, 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 that we sell off the land. Next slide, please. We still observe many of the same practices uh, have not been impaired uh, in our burn practices uh, since the wind farm was installed. Uh, next slide, please. And to our knowledge, there has been no detrimental effect whatsoever on the, the cattle that uh, graze here. Now, um, the wind farm uh, developer began a study in 2003 about the greater prairie chicken because in, in my mind that's kind of the canary in the coal mine of a healthy tall grass prairie. Uh, if you have greater prairie chicken you you probably have a pretty functional ecosystem. 
And so we all knew that going in. We measured them in 2003. Um, go to the next. So this is the results. Uh, they studied the prairie chicken on the, on the Feral Ranch from uh, 2003 until 2011. So, and the project was built in 05. And as predicted, the prairie chicken did vacate the site pretty much completely in 05 and 06. But uh, I'm gonna read the kind of the, this is published by um, Western Ecosystems Technology uh, and representatives from that company, Gregory Johnson, Eugene Young, and Gary Rope. Um, here we are, is, is kind of the, the bottom line of the study was um, lack attendance in the Elk River Wind Farm Project. The first bullet point reads, the number of leks and birds near the Elk River wind farm decreased considerably during the first four years after construction. That's 05 through 09. By 2010, more birds were present at the Elk River wind farm than prior to construction. And the number of leks was similar to pre-construction numbers by, 2000, uh, by 2011. Now, um, I'm going to take a little credit for that because the first thing I realized was uh, what, what, what's, who's, who's taking out the prairie chickens? Well, a couple of things, red-tailed hawks. And so I went around uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the square miles where the wind farm was, I cut down every tree. I used the wind farm money. I cut down every tree that was out there to reduce the chances of a predator perching there. Um, the other thing that we do on the feral ranch, and it was mentioned in the study, I should maybe bring that back up. Whoops, I lost it. Never mind. Um, was that um, we really uh, uh, care, we, we try not to overburn this ranch. And because we are less likely to burn than our neighbors, what may have happened is that we became a little more prairie chicken friendly. Uh, by the way, you're seeing here on this slide a group of um, domestic turkeys uh, that we are using again to as as part of our enterprise mix uh, here on the prairie. We have we have range fed range fed turkeys, but um, kind of back to the point is it in my opinion it has been our sensitivity to the burn regimen here that uh, has helped us maintain a healthy population of prairie chicken. There is a sad caveat to this story, and I'm, I wish that Zach or some other ecologist could come check this out. Um, two weeks before the Anderson Creek fire in 2016, it was, I'll never forget, it was May 6th, uh, we had a devastating wildfire on this ranch. It, it burned half our ranch in minutes. I mean, it was, it was incredible. Uh, we had 96 pieces of fire equipment on it, five counties. They closed the state highway, the federal highway, uh, getting ready to evacuate the town. We evacuated the headquarters. It was, it was unbelievable. And <clears throat> what I observed was the, the healthy lek we had in, on Grouse Creek, I'd, I'm not finding birds down there like, like we had. And, I can't, and I'd be interested. I, that's a question for Zach. Zach, it, is it possible? And I'll you know, take the field here in a minute. Is it possible that one bad fire could wipe them out? Like, will they not come back? Because that that was a clear evidence to me that our fire regimen was either helpful and in that case, very unhelpful. If you'll go to the next slide, please, Aaron. This is just um, uh, a pretty fall picture. One more, please. Just views of the ranch. Th this is the hill behind my house. Um, this is that amazing tall grass vista that we treasure. Uh, one more, please. Here's a picture of the wind farm from above. Um, the access road you see there is actually one of our ranch trails, uh, not a wind farm access trail. And then one more slide, please. I'll stand for questions, um, but at the, at the end of the day, um, we feel as though we've done a decent job of protecting the ecosystem 
while also generating renewable energy. And Zach, can, can you answer my question about the, the prairie chicken? Are you aware, like, what happened after Anderson Creek to the perhaps the lesser prairie chicken that, or, or were you studying uh, greater or lesser as a consequence of that fire? Um, not, not in particular. There are ongoing studies in the lesser prairie chicken area and, and anecdotally um, and, and uh, re, you know, population level research that was being done in the Anderson Creek and Starbuck fire areas did show that the populations decreased after that. And, and um, you know, those fires move much faster and they burn much hotter. There's, there's yeah. certainly a, a very strong difference between prescribed fire uh, and, and wildfire. And, and my family's got a ranch that, that burned at the same time as uh, uh, and and we saw the same thing you know fences that would not be in impacted by a prescribed fire were completely shot um, anecdotally a lek on on uh, a piece of ground we have uh, attendance was down the the year after that there were there were birds on that lek but not as many as we'd seen in the previous years um, the populations can recover somewhat they're not as as uh, uh, successful at, at having a quick rebound as, as pheasants and quail might be, but generally after a fire, if you've got not drought, um, you will have a little bit stronger reproduction in, in the following season or two. So, so they can bounce back a bit, but, but certainly large scale fire uh, is an impact to, to prairie chickens, white tailed deer, you know, a number of things. Oh, and um, again, Part of that study, I, I do want to mention, you know, the other hazard is that the blades will hurt the birds. Uh, for three years after construction, K-State sent students down here, helmets on, walking around the base of the turbines, looking for dead birds that would have been hit by the blades. During that period of time, they found nothing. I've been told by ranch hands since then that they have seen some dead birds. They have seen, um, uh, when I said this the other day, John said, no, I, I saw a red wing, uh, red wing blackbird, the remnants of one. So, um, you know, the, the blades move at the blade tip, it's running, it's going at 200 miles an hour out there. And so it's probably gonna happen, but we certainly don't see, unfortunately, we're not in a, one of the, one of the designated flyways that Zach was talking about. So I don't think we have migratory patterns right here, but we, we've not seen uh, bird loss of any significance from the blades themselves. Uh, the other thing, Zach, I was told to watch for was to, to watch for the animals who depend on their hearing for their defense. In other words, like jackrabbits, you know, would, would the background noise uh, cause those animals to lose their defense. And I'm very happy to report, and we have, a, we have an amazing population of jackrabbits, especially this year for some reason. I mean, they are, they are really out there. So we know the jackrabbit depends on his big ears to hear the coyote coming, and um, he, he's doing fine out there. What other questions do you all have for for Pete and for Zach um, around this issue of wind and wildlife. I see Ellie asked the question that I think I answered. Ellie Skoken. Ellie, did I answer your question? And for some reason, I'm not seeing a question from Ellie. Yeah, she says uh, someone from, she, she, I had told her about that story about bird impacts in the K-State study that uh, was done after construction. And I believe I've added. And then she asked, uh, when did I add bison? We added bison in 2013 and we, um, we divested a bison in 2019. They were here for six years um, that's another story. Um, I'm curious if there were 
um, we had a little bit of a talk about this earlier. You know, we, we have a lot of experience with wind development in Kansas, um, but we don't have a lot of experience yet with utility scale solar. Um, the solar in Kansas is, is pretty small sized. Um, and so, Zach, do you want to say just a, a minute or two about kind of where you all are in thinking about utility scale solar and how it might interact with wildlife? Um, in our state? Um, sure, I can speak to that. I also see that there's a, a question about uh, uh, deterrent technology yes. to reduce risk. So I'll, yes. I'll uh, start with that one. Um, uh, there are uh, some advancements in deterrent technologies. That's a, a very active um, area of research. Um, uh, I myself and the department in general is interested in those and, and the outcomes of those. Um, right now, um, we haven't seen any that are proven on, on the scale uh, and, and much less uh, uh, understanding how feasible they are to deploy at industrial scales that we have, we have never required the use of any deterrent technologies. Um, they have been recommended a, occasionally if we have a specific concern that we think it, it may help with, but, but right now our focus has been on, on habitat avoidance and, and minimization by and large. We, we feel that if we can keep the habitat um, uh, you know, as it exists, uh, uh, as uh, you know, everything is fragmented in some way now. There's there's nothing that's that's pristine out there. If if you start to kind of zoom out from from just what you can see down by your feet, um, but but we we want to further minimize. You know, you, you know, not not exacerbate that that habitat loss and fragmentation, and and so that is our big concern. Uh, I do pay attention to the research. There's an annual uh, an annual literature review that's done by the U.S. Geological Survey that, that has updates on, on a big proportion of that research. The Department of Energy and uh, the National Renewable Energy Lab in Colorado uh, do, a, do a good deal of research in, in that vein. And, and so we're attuned to it, hopeful that, that you know, uh, if, if something comes out that can deter 90% of bat fatalities, uh, you, you know, I think everyone would be happy and I'd be happy to, to recommend that on, on all new developments. But, but I haven't seen anything that's that successful. And knowing there's financial constraints, I, I have never put it in and say we require that, that you uh, implement this deterrent technology. Um, with regard to solar, solar is a, a, a new and developing thing. Um, if you had asked me a question about it uh, a year or two ago, the largest proposal I'd ever seen is a thousand acres, and that never got built um, up to this point. Um, uh, most of the solar in Kansas that has been built out has been community scale in, in the order of, you know, five to, to 100 acres, um, and siting decisions are pretty easy at, at, at that scale. Um, when we start getting up into to the, the multiple thousands, multiple hundreds of acres, then there's, there's some more to think about. There has not been enough uh, solar research done in the Great Plains for me to feel like I, I have everything answered and know all of the concerns. One of the large concerns right now would still be relative to the migratory uh, uh, waterfowl and, and whooping cranes. Uh, light, sunlight, when it hits a photovoltaic cell, uh, will reflect in a polarized fashion, and, and you can see it on Google Earth. If you go, I was, I was looking at something in California a year or two ago, and I was in the Bakersfield area on Google Earth, and I thought, how come they have a bunch of square lakes? And <laughs> then I zoomed in and realized those are all PV arrays. Um, so, so, you know, from Google Earth, it looks like a lake and uh, to migrating birds. It can look like a lake, and, and the interesting thing is it looks like a very calm lake, you know, one that's easy to land on. So, so there are some collision concerns with that or stranding concerns, pelicans that might migrate through Kansas twice a year. 
um, they're so big, they can't take off from land. They have to have the buoyancy of the water. So if you have a few hundred pelicans sit down in a PV array, uh, they're likely to die there, um, or they have to go get, get picked up and move to a body of water so that they can take off. Um, you know, and, and at the broad sense, again, our concern would be, would be habitat conservation. Um, so, so, you know, we focused a lot on birds and bats. There's also a lot of terrestrial species uh, that are listed in the state, especially in the grasslands and, and remnant forest areas. And, and uh, when you compare wind farms to solar farms, that's not an apples to apples comparison. Um, one is, is a fairly broad, uh, but, but localized Im impact um, at, at the site specific level. So, you know, a, a utility scale wind farm may take 40,000 acres, but only 40 acres of that is actually removed for turbine pads and, and roads. It's the influence that, that those turbines may have on the surrounding landscape. A thousand acre uh, a solar farm, they're gonna remove a thousand acres of habitat and, and that can be replanted um, between those, those uh, PV arrays. You can replant the grass, but uh, they're consolidated enough that, that it's essentially a, a full scale habitat removal. Um, some restoration can be done behind that uh, to try to improve things for wildlife, but, but all the ones that I've seen you know, they grade out, they grade out an area uh, to make a nice, nice smooth building surface and, and then any restoration is done at the back end. It's, it's our thought um, and it's, it's well supported in scientific literature over a lot, lot of years. A restoration is never as good as, as what nature has produced. It just, it takes too long. So, so if we have native Flint Hills Prairie and a, and a wind farm, or excuse me, a solar farm pr proposed in that, you know, that's taken eons to, to make that tall grass prairie. And we can, we can go in with 50 or 60 different grass and, and wildflower species, but we can't reproduce what, what, what nature has, has done there in any time scale that, that you and I would be familiar with. Thanks for that explanation, Zach. Um, we know that solar development is coming to Kansas. And so I think these are really important questions and conversations. And it's likely that, that you'll see another series at some point as we get more knowledge um, that focuses on utility scale solar. Um, I would say our understanding of the heart of the Flint Hills and, and the Flint Hills box where there's no wind development also means that there would be no solar development. Um, so, so solar developers who know Kansas recognize that that's not an option. Um, for them to, to develop in that area. Pete, I'll give you a final word before we close things out. Any, any final thoughts? Well, um, I just wanted to address Erica's question about wind technology. There, there, from my work in wind development, I am aware that wind farms uh, have a radar that will t detect birds. There are wind farms in Texas much closer to flyways than we are here at Elk River, but they will literally detect when the birds are coming in and turn the turbines off when the birds are in the area. So there are, and it's not just one, this is, this is, this is becoming more the standard are, if there are any migratory birds in the area, those wind farms have, uh, have radar that detect the birds and turn the blades off. And then when the birds go through, they turn them back on. But that is a piece of technology that's unique to wind. Right, right. Well, I just want to say thank you to Zach and to Pete for your insights and to thank all of you for joining us tonight. Um, we hope that this has been an informative and educational web, uh, webinar. Um, you can find a recording of this workshop on our YouTube channel and the slides that were presented um, will be available on our new website climateandenergy.org. Um, I appreciate so much um, you too and, and the wonderful work that you're doing. And Pete, as always, a pleasure to, to see uh, new pictures of, of Elk River and, and the great things that are happening there. So with that, good night and, and thank you so much.